Welcome, everybody. Um, Lynn McCready uh, set this all up for us, and we're really um, honored to have Systems let us present a webinar. Um, I'm Chris Sherwood. I'm an um, oceanographer at the U.S. Geological Survey in Woods Hole, um, and I'm one of the, the large group of people who have been working on uh, the, the sediment transport components in ROMs in the coast model that John Warner uh, has set up. And I'm going to let Courtney introduce herself, and then I'm going to kind of do the first part of the seminar talking about kind of the mechanics of what sediment transport is in coast. And then Courtney's going to talk about the real science that she and her students have been doing with that. Um, so anyway, go ahead. Courtney, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Courtney Harris. I'm a professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and this is Danielle Tarpley. Um, Danielle is a PhD candidate here at VIMS, and so to show you some of the applications that we've been doing with the cohesive sediment model, we're going to show you some of Danielle's um, dissertation results. And I'm also the chair of the CSDMS Marine Working Group. And we, CSDMS has asked each of the working groups to provide a webinar this year. And for the Marine Working Group, we thought that the webinar would be a great chance to show you all some of the recent model development that Chris and others have been doing to add cohesive um, transport processes to the ROMS-based um, community sediment transport modeling system. Okay. Thanks, Courtney. So I want to also make a call to Alfredo Aretzabaleta, who is uh, who, who uh, helped me develop some of the flock components in in uh, and the cohesive sediment stuff in coast. Um, and who uh, he and I have been um, working on this presentation a little bit for the coast uh, seminars when uh, when um, John Warner hosts his training for coast. This is some of this has been taken from the sediment transport component of that. And also, both Courtney and I wanted to kind of keep this informal, so you can uh, send a chat, and and uh, Lynn will um, unmute you, unmute you, and and uh, ask questions all along the way. Uh, don't. Don't feel shy to stop us if, if something's confusing. Um, so now can I change slides? Okay, so we're talking about one of the components of the coast uh, sediment transport modeling system. The coast is a the coupled atmosphere ocean wave sediment transport modeling system. Um, it's been kind of um, designed and, and maintained by John Warner here at the USGS. Um, but it's, it's got contributions from people all over the world and it's got a huge user base. We're mostly going to be talking about um, the sediment component, um, but the, the, the other main components that are important to know um, is the ocean component, which is based on the Rutgers, uh, originally the Rutgers uh, Regional Ocean Modeling System. Um, and we use SWAN for our wave modeling system, although you can also use WaveWatch 3. And the atmospheric system is controlled is is uh, contributed by the um, weather research forecast model, um, which is WARF. There's also um, an infragravity wave component and a sea ice component. And there's uh, along with the distribution, there's a bunch of modeling tools like MATLAB files and things like that. And all this com combined com is the uh, coast uh, sediment transport modeling system. So I'm going to talk briefly about all of the sediment transport components, not just the cohesive ones, so that, so that there's some context for understanding where the cohesive components came from. Um, and the things that are kind of related to sediment transport in, in the model, um, are obviously there's, there's um, routines for uh, eroding sediment, depositing sediment, um, changing the bed model so you can look at stratigraphy. Um, and today we'll talk about doing that for both sand, which is non-cohesive, um, or cohesive, which is mud or mixed sediments. Um, settling is an important component in ROMS. One aspect of the way that ROMS has decided to do settling is that once a sediment class has a settling velocity, that settling velocity stays fixed for the entire modeling run. That allows us to do um, very efficient um, and effective settling calculations, but it has the disadvantage of not allowing us to change the settling velocity of some component uh, kind of in real time as the model's running. So that's just a feature that you have to keep in mind. The uh, bed load, uh, the, the model includes bed load sediment transport um, using a couple of different equations. 
and flux diversion, so the calculation of erosion and deposition, which allows us to calculate morphological evolution, which is the um, aggregation of the bed or erosion of the bed. The new components, one of the new components that we put in for um, cohesive sediments is a flocculation and aggregation component. And the, uh, we do not explicitly include the, the um, sediment stratification correction in uh, as part of the, uh, the sediment boundary routines because it's included in the model. Um, if you turn it on, the, the model uh, turbulence closure equations will damp out turbulence uh, if there's sediment density stratification. So that's built in part of the model. An important part of any sediment transport scheme is that you have positive advection, uh, positive definite advection scheme. There are two of them now in, in ROMS and SWAN, but you have to remember to turn those on if you're doing sediment transport because otherwise you won't be able to um, make sure that you uh, conserve sediment, which is one of the components that we're shooting for. Um, lots of sediment transport equations need waves. Uh, especially coastal ones. You can either specify waves as input or you can couple with SWAN or uh, WaveWatch 3. Um, and it can be either one-way coupling where you just get wave information or two-way coupling where you can send back uh, changes in the water elevation that might be driven by the radiation stress from the waves back to the wave model uh, so that it's two-way coupled. We have uh, wave current combined bottom stresses via a few formulations and the model has wetting and drying. So the, the standard um, sediment transport components are, are fairly standard. Um, we, one of the most important features of any sediment transport component is making sediment available for picking up. And that's, so, so since we have the layers in the model that compose stratigraphy, there are, um, we have an active layer thickness based on, on the Harrison Weiberg formulation that basically makes some of that sediment available uh, and that active thickness is uh, dependent on the excess shear stress. Erosion is a flux formulation where, where there are basically two parameters. There's an erosion rate, um, and, which is E, and a critical shear stress for erosion, which has to be exceeded before sediment will come out. And that is um, applied on a class by class basis. In, in, so if you have several different sediment classes, the critical shear stress and the erosion rate parameter may vary for each one. Sedimentation back into the bed is a flux formulation where it's basically the sediment settling velocity times the sediment concentration at, at the uh, near the uh, bottom of the bed. And net deposition is just the sum of those two processes. There's a number of different bed load formulations. There's the um, kind of classic Meyer Peter Mueller equation. Um, there's a Soulsby and Damgard equation that brings in a little bit of velocity asymmetry and allows uh, um, and uh, allows you to to uh, uh, somewhat correct for asymmetrical sediment transport. Um, both of those um, depend on the combination of of um, wave and current uh, components of the sediment uh, of, of the bed shear stress. Um, there's a bed slope effect so that it's harder to push sediment up a bed or down a bed. And one of the things that we're working on now is we're working on adding um, another asymmetrical wave driven bed load transport based basically on the Santos formulation um, and using bulk wave parameters to um, assess the asymmetry. So these are the, the, the sediment transport equations that have been in ROMS for quite a while uh, and, and have been used for lots of successful simulations. Bottom boundary layer is, uh, it, for the most part, when we're doing sediment transport, we use the law of the wall so that the roughness is, is characterized by a, a Z naught, a bed roughness. That Z naught can uh, be a combination of a number of things, the kind of the Nicaragua grain size roughness, the Z naught for sediment transport, and maybe another Z naught for bed forms, and those can kind of uh, can be added. All these things can be controlled in the model switches. You can turn on which ones you want to include and which ones you don't want to include. The wave current bottom boundary layer is important because when you have waves, uh, the orbital motions of waves increases the turbulence right near the bed, uh, and that couples the overlying flow to the, to the bed more tightly, uh, and that kind of results in an apparent 
increased drag of the on the mean flow, well, and and that's characterized in in these formulations as a z naught apparent, which is usually higher than the regular z naught, and associated. And, and there are a number of different wave current boundary layer formulations in here. Um, we tend to default to the to the Madsen uh, 1994 formulation when we do our modelings. Um, when there are ripples on the seafloor, that increases the roughness of the seabed. Um, and there are some formulations that relate the ripple roughness um, to basically the height times the steepness of the bed forms. Um, some of this is really form drag uh, and, and doesn't uh, come in as skin friction. So we use the uh, McLean uh, formulation, to uh, the Smith and McLean formulation, to partition the, that drag. Uh, so that we don't include the form drag component in the skin friction component of the bed roughness. So these are things that are all turned on and turned off with if def statements at compilation time. You basically set up the model compilation. And so um, this is kind of a pseudocode over here on the right that shows the sediment flow. Um, and if uh, sediment is defined, then all these things occur. If bed load is defined, then you turn on bed load. If suspended load is defined, then that's included. Um, and even all of these uh, have sub options. And although we can't really get into that in great detail now, we have lots of examples in the, uh, that John has included in the, in the code where you can look and see how we turn on different components of this code. So what we're gonna talk about today mostly is the, is the cohesive component of the sediment transport. Um, and that includes both cohesive and mixed um, sand and mud components. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about biodiffusion, which allows the uh, sediments in the bed to mix um, and, and change the stratigraphy. We're going to talk about flocks. Um, and one of the things that having these components in the, in the model allow you to do is to actually characterize the biogeochemistry of the bed, which we're not, we're not going to talk about that much today. But Courtney has been taking a lot of, the, um, a lot of these components that we've been working on and along with her students have been applying them to real world situations. So recently she's had a number of students who have taken these components of ROMs um, and published great papers on them. JP, um, Kelsey, Julia, and Danielle are all um, taking, have taken components and, and done really cool science with all of them. So here's a quick example of how the uh, non-cohesive bed works. This is a, one of the first simulations that John Warner did. Um, in uh, Massachusetts Bay, he basically applied a, a series of typical nor'easter storms like the one we had all weekend. Um, and he started off with a kind of a uniform sediment um, distribution on the bed uh, and, and uh, hit it several times with these storms. So here's a map in the upper left-hand corner of the bed stress, uh, kind of at the peak of one of these storms. And the higher colors or higher bed stresses typically in the shallower areas. Um, over on the right is the bath bathymetry change. That's uh, the biggest changes here are only five millimeters, um, but it shows that there's erosion in some of the places with high bed stress and a little bit of deposition in some of the quieter, deeper basins. And on the left is a map of mapped uh, of sampled grain sizes in the area. And on the right is what, um, what the ROMS surficial sediment ended up looking like after several of these storms hit. And this kind of gives us some kind of reassurance that the model is changing the bed sediment um, in kind of re reasonable ways using both the stratigraphy and the sediment transport routines we've got. So that's non-cohesive sediment. Let's talk about cohesive. The cohesive, um, the cohesive bed model is, is built on a very simple and, and, and somewhat heuristic idea that there's an equilibrium um, well, first of all, that, that in cohesive sediment, rather than worrying about the individual grain size critical shear stress, what's important is kind of a bulk critical shear stress of the whole bed. So you, the idea is that if it's muddy and cohesive, you can't erode one grain out of that bed at a time. You basically have to exceed the critical, the bulk critical shear stress of the bed in order to get erosion. And then, of course, individual grains come out, but, but their, the erosion rate is not dependent on their individual critical shear stress. And that in general, that profile of critical shear stress changes with depth in the bed. Typically it increases as the bed is increasingly compacted. And so we, we have this concept of a equilibrium uh, critical shear stress profile 
in the bed, which typically increases with depth up to some asymptotic value. So the curve kind of looks like the one on the left. Um, and the idea is that if you erode that bed, you kind of cut into that profile and truncate it. So you end up with something like this profile over here on the right, where the critical shear stress is now higher up at the bed, uh, top of the bed. Um, if you deposit a bunch of uh, fluffy co non-cohesive sediment on the bed, you may end up with a big uh, pile of, of uh, kind of less easier to move, less cohesive material on the top of the bed. And presumably over time that will compact and you'll work towards the critical, towards the equilibrium profile. Uh, alternative is if you've, if you've truncated that profile um, and exposed difficult to move material to the um, seabed, that that will kind of water and swell and gradually, maybe bioturbate, gradually go back to the equilibrium profile. Um, the concept is that that takes a lot longer to happen than uh, compaction, which happens fairly reasonably. So we think there's something like an order of 100 times difference between the time scales of those two processes. But the idea is whenever you put the bed out of, e out of equilibrium, it'll try and get back into that equi equilibrium at a certain speed. So here's an example of what happens during erosion. Um, the initial bed level was right here at the Z level. Um, and then uh, we applied a critical shear stress that was in excess of the critical shear stress at the bed. And we truncated the bed. We eroded about two millimeters of the bed. Now the critical shear stress follows this, follows this black curve. Um, and, and it shows you that the material right at the bed surface is difficult to erode. Probably the erosion process stopped as, as that material became harder and harder to erode. And that's what, that's what caused it to stop eroding when it got down by two millimeters. Um, the, the equilibrium curve is in red. And so over time now, if, the, if nothing else changes, that will slowly migrate back towards the, the black curve. I'm sorry, I have this, sorry. The black curve will slowly migrate back towards the equilibrium red curve. The opposite happens if you're depositing on a cohesive bed. In this case on the left, the bed level was at zero. Water was up here in the blue. Um, we deposited two millimeters of material and the critical shear stress of that material, uh, the equilibrium shear stress is shown in red. And you can see that that material at the, at the surface is easy to move. Um, but over time, as it compacts, um, that material, the black curve moves towards the red curve and it becomes more difficult uh, to move as it compacts. So that's kind of the idea. Here's an example of the model being run doing that. Um, and I, I won't go over this. It's basically the same sequence of events. Um, the erosion rate truncates the bed and removes sediment. Uh, after a while, that, that uh, sediment um, swells and becomes easier to, to move. Um, and then there's a deposition when the shear stress time series decreases, there's deposition of fine material at the top. And there are a number of different parameters that control this. Um, that, that um, we need to worry about, but I'm gonna focus more on examples here. Over on the right is, a, is an example that includes the uh, stratigraphy of the bed. And what we've got is seen, <coughs> excuse me, several size classes. Um, yellow is sand and the darker colors are mud. This top panel shows how much, what material is in suspension of the bed. The middle panel is a kind of an artificial time series of bed shear stress where we start with no shear stress, we have a high stress event, which then stops low shear stress, another high stress event with kind of a different shape and then no stress. Um, and the active layer thickness that's associated with these and changes as the stress changes is shown in the bottom panel. And so what you're seeing is that you apply a, a, a large amount of shear stress. And then when you decrease that shear stress at the end of this event, material starts settling out so that the concentrations are decreasing in the, in the uh, in the water column. And you notice that the sand falls out first as it should, because it's got a higher settling velocity. Uh, and then the silt falls out or the, the finer sand and then the classes of mud. And so over on the right, you can see that the stratigraphy that was built after this resuspension and erosion, uh, resuspension and deposition event occurred is a typical fining upward sequence. 
where you have uh, high amounts of sand deeper in the sediment column and increasing uh, finer sediment as you go up. And so this is another example um, where it's kind of a simple conceptual model that um, produces what we would expect from our knowledge of what, how sediment is supposed to perform in the, in the how, how sediment is supposed to behave in the water column. So the mixed mud, um, or the mixed bed behavior is, is um, an attempt to combine the two end members. We talked a little bit about the non-cohesive sediment where, where the uh, erosion rate depends only on the particle critical shear stress. We talked a little bit about the cohesive sediment bed where the critical shear stress depends on a bulk um, critical shear stress that applies to all the sediment. And the idea of the mixed bed is that there's some ratio of sand and mud um, that produces those two end members. So if you've got, if you've got more than about um, 20 or 30 percent mud, um, you're going to behave completely cohesively. Um, and so it's going to behave as a cohesive bed. If, you're, if, you're, if you've got a very small amount of mud, maybe less than something like 3 to 10 percent, there's no cohesion at all. And the mud is just in the matrix of the sand and can be resuspended by the sand. And then in the middle, for lack of any other better approach, we basically have gone uh, kind of a linear combination. And what we're doing is we're saying that the critical shear stress uh, for resuspension kind of gradually goes from one end member to the other as you go through, as you mix these sediments. Um, and, uh, and so what we are changing as we go through that, as we, as we look at the, the, the uh, non-cohesive component, we just call this P-co, um, we switch from being totally non-cohesive to totally cohesive kind of linearly. And that produces kind of re reasonable results. Here's the uh, flux of clay based on how much mud is in there. So if you have very little mud, you're over here on the left. left. Silt and clay can be easily resuspended from the matrix during a storm. And so the erosion flux is very high. It kind of gradually decreases. And then when you get over onto the right, you're behaving completely cohesively. And that material all comes out together whenever the cohesive shear stress is eroded. Unless, unless the material is so difficult to erode. Let's say you've got um, pebbles in a mud matrix or something like that. Those pebbles won't move and come out of the bed unless not only the matrix, the, the bulk cohesive stress is exceeded, but also the critical shear stress for those individual petals will be exceeded. So, so it's, a, it's a kind of a heuristic overall approach, but it seems to produce kind of reasonable um, results. Um, finally, one of the component that's important um, for, for any model that has stratigraphy in it is some kind of mixing within the bed, because in the real world, there's often either ripples migrating across the surface, which tend to mix down to a certain level, or there are animals, fauna and fauna in the bed, which um, move the sediment around. And this schematic over here um, shows the importance for um, geochemical processes. Often um, sediment is, is um, resuspended into the water column, and then it can uh, react with components in the water column with either resuspension and desorption of, say, contaminants that are in that sediment, or adsorption of something that's in the water column onto the particles, and then they deposit down, um, and, and they form a layer that, that is kind of uniform initially at the top, but then it mixes and mixes that bed in. And we kind of envision that there's some kind of a profile that looks kind of like this. You can, you can make a profile that includes any of these components as input to the, to the model. The idea is that near the surface, there's come a kind of a high mixing rate, and it might be uniform for a certain thickness. And then way down deep someplace, there's no um, mixing associated with in fauna or surface. There, that, that there may be molecular diffusivity in the pore water or something, but essentially there's zero mechanical mixing. And then we kind of put an exponential profile in between those two end members. So that's kind of the conceptual model that we are using for our, our mixing. And when you combine that with the mixed bed model, you get a number of different results depending on where you are. And, and if you, uh, this, this um, is in the paper where we describe it, and I, I won't go through it in detail, but in 
in, you can see that the stratigraphy that results from changing the, from non-cohesive to mixed bed and from changing the biodiffusion varies. And, and um, in, in this case with the large biodiffusion, the biodiffusion mixes down to some uh, bed with the mixed bed. And so you're getting changes deeper into the bed with this case than you are with the small biodiffusion diffusivity, which doesn't reach as far into the bed. And so, so there's a kind of a tapering of the mixing uh, in the ultimate stratigraphy. Well, these are part of some of the um, kind of the um, test cases that there were conceptual cases so that we can make sure that the model was doing things that seemed reasonable. Finally, one of the important things that we've got in the model um, is the flocculation component. And um, we're following a, a, a model called Flocmol um, that was um, um, developed by Vernet and uh, and he has helped us implement it in ROMs. Uh, and the, con the idea is that there's a fractal dimension that relates the, the density of the flocks with the volume of the flocks. And ideally, if the fractal dimension is three, the flocks are completely solid, so they're, they're regular spheres. And, they're, and their flock diameter is the same as their solid spherical diameter. So there's no, no difference between these two components on the right. But as you reduce the fractal, fractal dimension, the um, density of the flocks becomes lower um, and the flock size becomes relatively bigger for, for an equivalent diameter. Um, and, and so we relate the size to the, to the, to the uh, fractal dimension. And the change in the, in the grain size of any particular flock class is a function of um, gain by aggregation, gain um, in that class by um, breakup by shear of a larger class, so, so material comes into this, um, breakup by collision of a larger class, which might put some components into this, loss due to aggregation, so two sizes in this size class might uh, aggregate, and, and so that material will be lost to a larger size class, um, and loss by breaking up from this size class and loss by, break, by collision. Um, the shear and the collision uh, are both in, those rates are both increased as concentration and turbulence increases um, as, as is, uh, so, so if you have lots of turbulence, you can break up flocks. Aggregation requires both turbulence, so particles see each other, but also um, the higher the concentration, the more likely that two particles will see each other and, and aggregate. So a typical, typically we will, break our um, class sizes into a number of different, uh, break our sediment into a number of different size classes and distribute them logarithmically by size. Uh, and then the settling velocity is associated with the particle density uh, and changes uh, as a function of size. And, uh, and the mass basically is moved among these classes through aggregation and, and disaggregation, depending primarily on the shear stress and the density of material that's there. So we did some test cases. This is a, a test case where you've got a kind of a tank of water uh, and you increase the shear, the concentration, you keep the same amount of sediment in it, increase the shear in that tank of water uh, and the flock sizes decrease um, in, as, as the shear rate increases as they get torn apart, then you decrease the shear. The shear rate is the gray uh, pyramids here. Um, you decrease the shear rate and the flocks uh, are still being moved around and they aggregate and then they end up with a larger diameter. In the real world, that would settle out, um, but in this tank, they can't really settle. They can settle to the bottom, but they get resuspended. Um, and this is one data set that we can use to demonstrate that the model, it seems to be doing the same thing that the uh, field experiment does. Another uh, idea is whether or not the flocks come into kind of some equilibrium diameter in the in in Winter Warp's original uh, one of his original flock papers, he argued that there's a linear relationship um, between the flock size and the uh, ratio of concentration in the square root of the shear in the water column. Um, and these linear relationships change depending on the aggregation and the breakup parameters. So each one of these curves represents a different um, parameters. So these are these are somewhat um, tunable parameters that determine what the equilibrium flock size is. 
depending on the rate ratio of concentration and shear. And so these are model results in the dots in blue um, and linear fits that show that, that the model does kind of come to equilibrium sizes depending on the conditions. And this is kind of a, a, a very simple experiment where we've, where we've taken the water column and just taken it from a still um, water column with uh, a initially uniform distribution of flux in the water column. So this is the flock concentration in the top panel, the elevation, uh, the uh, mean diameter, the weighted uh, average diameter of the flocks in, in this column, and the settling velocity of the flocks in this column. Initially, the flocks are uniformly distributed. The water column is accelerated. Uh, the flow velocity increases. The turbulence increases. Initially, the flocks start settling out. Um, but as they settle out, they end up in the high concentration region in the bottom, um, where there's a lot of shear and a lot of concentration. So there's a lot of aggregation. And over time, um, this whole system kind of comes to a dynamic equilibrium where uh, you have a concentration profile that looks like this. Uh, you have a diameter which looks like this. So you have smaller particles up near the top of the water column, larger particles near the bottom. Um, and you have an average settling velocity that looks like this. And this little kickback in the right near the bed is, is actually the wave current bottom boundary layer where there's so much shear that the flock size is cut right down. And these profiles for each individual class are shown over on the right. So one last thing I wanted to mention before Courtney talks about how we actually had used this model, how she and her students have used this model, is that there's also a vegetation drag component now in, in ROMs um, that was put in by Alexei Bodin and uh, Neil Ganju and, and others here in this lab. Um, and the idea is to be able to put in FRAG associated with uh, submerged aquatic vegeta vegetation. And so there's an interaction between the parameters from the SWAN model uh, and, the, and the flow model that go through the vegetation depending on uh, different uh, parameters. And it has a number of effects. It, it, um, it, within the canopy, it reduces the amount of TKE, and so there's less mixing in the canopy. But above the canopy, the, the flexible component of the submerged canopy can en enhance the TKA. And so the vertical distribution of particles that are in the water column end are quite different if you include the SAV component of the model. Um, so here's kind of a summary of the different components of that model. And I recommend that, uh, that you have a look at the paper if you want to include that in your uh, in your model, but it's, it's for modeling, for example, marshes or uh, seagrass beds, this seems to be a very effective uh, addition to the model. So um, I'm gonna, about to turn it over to Courtney and I'm gonna let her uh, start sharing her screen. The way all this is accomplished in the model um, are details that are probably too difficult to get into here, but basically you need to include changes in the .h file, which changes how the model is actually set up uh, you need to make changes in the input files that describe what kind of input you're providing to the model. Uh, you need to have, uh, you need to describe the sediment components that you've got, um, and you need to either initialize the model analytically or with some kind of initial file that shows the spatial distribution of all these components in there. Um, and there are good examples in the ROMS distribution of how to do this, but um, we're also welcome to answer questions here or on the forum as to how to actually implement this. And so I think that's it for me, Courtney. Um, maybe I should stop and ask if there are any questions while Courtney shares her screen. And I'm going to unsharing. I'm going to stop sharing mine. Yeah. So if there are any questions while I figure out how to share my screen, that would be great. I noticed that Aaron Beaver's on there, and I. <laughs> Forgot to include him as one of your students who is doing very cool stuff with this model. So sorry about that, Aaron. And, all right, are you guys? Hey Chris? Yeah. Yeah, this is Larry Sanford. Hi. Hi, Larry. Uh, so how do, when you when you have bioturbation in the model, do you, are there any issues with numerical uh, diffusion between the layers? There's a little bit of numerical diffusion, but it's much much smaller. We're we're using a um, we tested that kind of extensively. And we have, um, there's, there's more diffusion than there might be because there's variable bed thickness brought into there. So there's a, there's a DZ component in the, in the equation, but we're, we're um, using a fully 
implicit solution that is stable and has errors that are less than 1%. Um, it, the numerical diffusion is less than 1% when we do a bunch of analytical tests with analytical distributions. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, are there any other questions before we move on to trying to show a few applications of the cohesive model? Okay, um, so what I wanna do with the kind of next 10 minutes or so is to show you some of Danielle Tarpley's PhD results. So Danielle is a PhD candidate. She's co-advised by Carl Friedrichs and myself. So Carl is co-author on all of these, um, the work she's doing. And Chris is also on her dissertation committee. So he's also been um, heavily involved in the model applications that she's been doing. So one focus of Danielle's um, work is to try to quantify how the cohesive sediment transport processes impact the York River estuary, which is the uh, system that is you know, right outside my window here at VIMS. So she's been using the um, sediment transport model that Chris just um, gave a great overview of, and she's been specifically in not including the non-cohesive version, which Chris covered in the beginning of his talk, but accounting for the cohesive version of the model and specifically looking at the effects of flocculation and bed consolidation. So here, um, this is showing kind of schematics from what Chris already covered. Danielle's model runs include both bed consolidation, which uses the um, model that Chris covered that was originally developed by um, Larry Sanford. And it includes this kind of parameterized critical shear stress um, at equilibrium depth profile. And then the model tracks the instantaneous critical shear stress for erosion and nudges it at each time step back towards the equilibrium value. And then on the bottom here is just a schematic of the flock model that um, Chris just discussed. And Danielle has been using this with, I think about 11 size classes to try to account for um, flocculation processes in a system like the York River. So just a shout out to the work that um, this talk was kind of put together based on stuff that Danielle presented just last week uh, at the SURF meeting in Alabama. So for her model runs, she has set up an idealized estuary model and she based it, the kind of overall dimensions and hydrodynamics of this model on the York River estuary. But one thing to note is that we're using this idealized kind of 2D representation of the York because especially the flocculation model was computationally expensive. So we wanted to get a feel for how important the flocculation processes were in this idealized system before we attempted to run it in a full 3D model, which would have you know, many more grid cells. So the basic features of her idealized model grid is we have a riverine input. I'm not sure if, I don't think you guys can see my pointer. We have an, um, a river input to the right coming in relatively shallow, shallow water putting in um, fresh water. And then on the left hand side, the downstream boundary condition is a tidal boundary condition with um, salty water fluxing in and out with the, with the tide. And then underneath the water column is a sediment bed model that accounts for the bed consolidation um, processes that we talked about, that Chris talked about earlier. So we're gonna show you an animation of the model run. So the top, she ran the model for this case twice. Um, once she included the flocculation processes and then the second time she ran it, she did not include flocculation. So here the arrows will be the current velocity. The red um, lines represent the isopycnals. So showing you how the salt distribution is set up. And then the color is suspended sediment concentration concentration in milligrams per liter. So now if you can see the time dependency of the model, we see the tides fluxing in and out, and we see that the sediment concentrations are heavily um, weighted towards having high sediment concentrations here in this turbidity maximum region. And we also see that there's quite a big difference in overall suspended sediment concentration when flocculation is included compared to when it was not included. 
So again, the major features that we see is the difference in sediment concentrations when we include flocculation, and that whether or not we included flocculation, we did get an estuarine turbidity maximum that's formed by the sediment trapping at the, halt, at the um, head of the salty region. So in this model, in her um, 2019 paper, Danielle ran the model with and without each of these cohesive processes. So on the bottom panel here on the, on the right is showing the overall um, depth integrated amount of suspended sediment concentration for a model run that, that included both consolidation and um, flocculation. And so that is the blue line. And then in the green and the red lines, those were models that either for the red line did not include flocculation and for the green line did not include bed consolidation. So with both of those, we see that we see um, two kind of twofold differences in overall suspended sediment concentration when we neglect those cohesive processes. And then here, she differenced the suspended sediment concentration in each of those, in each of kind of the modeled size classes. I think she included 11 different size classes ranging from one micron up to um, 1,000 micron sediment. Wherever you see blue, that means that when she included flocculation, there was less of that sediment in suspension. Where you see red, that indicates that when she included flocculation, there was more of that sediment in suspension. So what we see is that our main differences in sediment concentration are in the ETM, and that flocculation there acted to aggregate the finer sediment and package it, repackage it as the coarser aggregates. And then something she's been looking at more recently is to try to evaluate how good this equilibrium model is when we apply it to our idealized estuary. So Chris already showed um, this figure where he ran the flock model to steady state for three different cases and showed that at steady state it did meet Winterrup's ideas about equilibrium flock sizes. Um, Danielle pulled out times from her idealized model where she thought that the model would likely be at steady state at this equilibrium flock size. And so that was at, I believe, the peak flood and ebb times for um, the ETM locations. So each dot represents uh, the equilibrium uh, or the, the instantaneous size that was calculated by the model. And then the, the black line on it is the same equilibrium line that she obtained. The, the black line represents a best fit to these points. And then the color of the dot indicates how high in the water column that point was. So the dark blue dots are the very near bed um, data points, and then the red ones would be in the upper water column. So overall, we conclude that during these times of peak flow that the, the model is pretty much approaching an equilibrium flock size distribution. But when we plot all of the scatter for the um, di instantaneous diameter from the model, compared to that equilibrium flock scaling shown as a black line, we see that a lot of times the model is producing flock sizes that are very different from the equilibrium flock model. So here the very bottom grid layer is shown as these black triangles, and then the colors of all the other dots indicate how high up in the water column it was, with blue being near the bed and red being near the water surface. So we see that throughout the water column there are times when the model does not meet this equilibrium size distribution. So what she's been looking at in her analysis more recently is trying to evaluate the importance of flocculation um, throughout different time periods and at different locations in the, um, in the, in the idealized model. So I'm just going to show a few um, of her recent results, kind of, and these point out the importance of the flocculation terms as well as when the model is at this equilibrium flock size distribution and when it is really not quite there. So on these panels, the, the very right hand panel, whoops, sorry, the very right hand panel shows the um, time, the kind of tidal, where we are in terms of the tide in the model. So so we're showing that we're going to show you results from points one, two, and three, which represent slack tide, um, raising flood tide, and then peak flood tide. And then the panels to the left show model results from each of those three time periods. 
On each of these panels, we're showing the grain size diameter with the finest stuff being to the left, the coarsest stuff being to the right, and we're showing the, the mass, um, the amount of mass that's being transferred through flocculation for each of those size classes. So wherever these bar graphs are above um, zero, that means that that size is being added to by the flocculation process. And wherever that bar graph is below zero, that means that the flocculation process is acting to take material out of that size class. So here during the flood conditions at times two and three, we see that we're disaggregating our larger particles and form and they as they break up, they're forming more of the small of the medium sized flocks. And then the other data points that are in these graphs are these dashed vertical lines. The red dashed vertical line is the equilibrium diameter and then the black vertical line is the instantaneous uh, modeled flock diameter. So we see that during times two and three, the equilibrium diameters are finer than the instantaneous. And so in order to nudge the system back towards equilibrium, what the model's doing is breaking up the larger flocks to form those medium sized flocks, okay? And then I should have pointed out that this model data is from the very near bed. So at the very near bed at peak flood, we're not at equilibrium. We're resuspending stuff that is coarser than the equilibrium flock size, and that stuff is quickly being disaggregated and um, put up and then put into the finer sizes. And then these panels are the same panels, again, looking at conditions as we go from peak flood down to peak ebb. And again, we see pretty similar behavior with, with we tend to resuspend sediment that is coarser than the equilibrium. And when we are at higher shear stresses, that stuff breaks up to form the medium sized flocks. But that was all very close to the bed. When we look at what's going on about a meter above the bed, so for these results, Danielle took model estimates from um, a grid cell that was 90 centimeters above the bed. And there we see that the system tends to be reaching more of the equilibrium sizes when we are more at the peak flood because the equilibrium flock size diameter is closer to the instantaneous one at times uh, at time three when we're at peak flood. And there also in this upper water column, we've switched from um, disaggregation being important to aggregation being important. For most of our mass balance terms, we have, we're losing sediment mass in these medium sizes and the, that stuff is is, um, is especially at peak flow conditions, that stuff is aggregating to form the coarser, the bigger aggregates. Okay. So to conclude, some of the results that we're seeing from this idealized estuary case is that the idealized estuary case does re reproduce the key features of, the, um, of our idealized estuary, such as estuarine circulation, forming the ETM, but in order to get realistic values for the um, sediment concentrations, Danielle needed to include the co cohesive processes of bed consolidation and flocculation. The flocculation had the biggest impact on the suspended sediment concentration in the ETM, and it reduced sediment concentration by about 50% there. Outside of the ETM, the bed consolidation had a bigger effect, and it, but it also decreased sediment concentrations by about 50%. And then in Danielle's more recent results, we're seeing that flocculation is transferring as much or even more sediment in the um, flock term compared to the horizontal and vertical advection terms. I didn't show those results today just for time, but that's kind of one of the significant results that we're seeing out of her model runs. And then finally, that the model that accounts for this time dependency in the flock size showed that in our idealized estuary, a lot of times the flock size did not reach the equilibrium flock size. It seems to only really reach the equilibrium flock size when we have peak flow conditions and um, up above that immediate resuspension layer. So that's what I had, if there are questions either for me or Chris or Danielle. And I presented this today, it's really Danielle's work, but she's been um, busy writing up her results, so she, <laughs> I'm sure she, <laughs> yeah.
So maybe if there are no, I can't see the chat thing now. Lynn was going to keep an eye on that to see if there are any questions. It looks like uh, you may have two questions coming. Okay. I think somebody's probably typing at this moment. Danielle's trying to help me figure out how to do this. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there are two questions. Okay. <laughs> so Danielle, the first question is, why didn't you present this? <laughs> because I'm trying to write it up in word form. So did you spend the weekend writing or working on this talk? I spent most of the weekend writing. <laughs> She did present it at SURF um, a week and a half ago and did a much better job than I did today, probably, so. And did you have another question? Have we thought about the effect of hyperpixel flows? Yes, we have thought about it. Um, and there are examples of the ROMS model being, um, being used to account for hyperpixel flows. Shannon Chen did a kind of similar to our idealized estuary. Shannon Chen did a paper where he used the ROMS model in a 2D across shelf case to account for hyperpycnal flows. Um, Aaron Beaver, who I believe is on the call as part of his dissertation, he looked, he included that um, the sediment density effect to look at whether um, a river in New Zealand would plunge during high um, discharge. Um, the shelf off of that particular river right off of the river mouth is not very steep, so that river wouldn't really um, plunge to very deep because it kind of emptied into an embayment. And so the, so I guess the way I would include hyperpycnal flows from a river mouth right now would be to try to have sufficient vertical resolution so that we would have some hope of capturing the suspended sediment stratification at the kind of top of that hyperpycnal layer. And, but to date, I, I have not seen cases where people ran it for kind of a realistic um, um, model grid in bathymetry. So maybe Larry's question. Yeah, hi, Courtney. <clears throat> hi, Daniel. Um, so when you're using the flock model, you've got, Chris said that for you have a, a, a fixed number of settling classes, and each class has a fixed settling velocity. Right? Correct. Did that, right? So, did you set your, so you had one basic fine sediment size and you just divided your sediment classes into different classes of flocks? Is that the way you did, it? did this? And each class of flock had its own settling velocity? Yes. Oh, okay. The and, and, they all, and it assumes so, that all classes of flocks are, the have the same fractal dimension. Mm -hmm. and right. Primary right. vertical size. Right. So the settling velocities are just what it, what's assigned to it by the same fundamental size and the same fractal dimension, but then they're different categories of flock. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, cool. And also, do you have what's what? Do you have the the actual citation for your 2019 paper? Yeah, I think it's on Courtney's presentation, um, but it's in the Journal of Marine Science and uh, Engineering. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. I believe the next question was from Hao Wang. Um, what would like to know how our group creates ROMs grids and what we use for grid generation. <laughs> Chris, have you done that recently? I my group has done it, and I used an M file that was called Easy Grid, and I decided that might be a misnomer. <laughs> But we tried to update EasyGrid. That's what we did. 
And and recently, I've I've been doing it um, in Python, but it's not it it it's been very um, it, it hasn't been a GUI operation. It's it's been you know actually me picking the points that I want to do and then doing the smoothing and the and and all the things for the bathymetry grid and then finally writing out a ROMs grid. So there's a there are some Getting, getting from an XYZ grid in MATLAB to a ROMs grid is pretty easy because there's some tools in the ROMs toolbox for doing that. But slapping down a grid, a curvilinear grid on a, on a you know, a bathymetry map, um, there are a number of ways to do that. And I don't think any of them are completely satisfactory, but that, but um, that easy grid is probably the best way to start. Well, I, I remember at the Coast user group meeting last February that they asked for a show of hands of who had used easy grid and it was like me and one other person. <laughs> so, and John and Danielle's reminding me that John Warner had some other tools. Yeah. He had some grading tools. I don't remember what they were that I come think, with the coast distribution. I think so. So I would probably look at those first before easy grid or Chris's Python tools that he mentioned. Um, and there was a question about bed, whether the bed consol consolidation module changes the sediment bulk density to reduce the layer's thickness within the bed layers. So, so the answer is yes, it does do that. So the mass of the sediment is conserved, the bulk density changes, and the thickness of the layers change. But none of that, those things aren't really calculated dynamically. They're only calculated kind of um, uh, through this equilibrium profile approach. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and Chris, are you following the chat? So Brian Romans has a question. Um, uh, let's see. Applications to the deep sea, three to five kilometers water depth, contrite currents and drifts. Um, so, and Brian is wondering if we've used cohesive models in that context. So, so I have, I've run the ROMS model to try to represent the Gulf of Mexico continental shelf to slope. And we do get in the model contour currents. We do get resuspension from fast, relatively fast flowing currents along the continental slope. So in the model, the shelf is definitely wave driven, transport dominates, but when we get deeper, you know, in the Gulf of Mexico off of, when we get beyond the, the shelf slope break, what dominates resuspension is fast currents that come through. Now, whether those, whether those are Real, we don't really have good data, time series data, to evaluate how good those contour currents that we get in the model are. And that is something that I think is important to try to do is a more tightly coupled deep sea um, model data comparison. And in my model, we I have not used the cohesive model at at this point yet, we've used a non-cohesive formulation. And I, I can't speak to what other people have done in the deep sea, but I think it's important <laughs> to uh, try to get better studies. Okay. Um, Hao Wang wrote on the chat to try, that he might try easy grid. He's tried grid builder and not liked it, he or she. I'm sorry. Okay, are there other questions or any that we missed in the chat? No. Well, thanks to everybody for participating and thanks to Lynn and Systems for organizing this.